Hey. That was a genuine stagger. <laughs> that wasn't a pretend stagger. That was a. I was actually. I, our guys said, yeah. "Do you want to start the show or something?" No, we no, no. I don't, or can I, we just bust right into no, it? No, I'm glad that you dropped in, literally, and <laughs> just take it where you want to take it. I, did, I was just saying that I on my schedule it said to, to be here. I live in Atlanta. So to be here at five o'clock, right, Victor? Victor, this is Vic Henley, is my right? dear friend and yeah. great comedian, and my yeah. man on the ground. And I uh, said to be here at five, from five to six. Yeah. At five o'clock, I was sober. <laughs> <laughs> but you missed that window, my friend. Yeah. So well, now you got me how you got me. Well, I ran into you just five minutes ago, and one of us just reeks of marijuana. <laughs> I would say probably two of us do. I, I don't think it's one. I know. I, I know. I, I'm stoned. I, I, yeah. I'm, and I've been swilling booze down the street. And, that don't uh, make you a bad I, person. No, it doesn't. It no. doesn't. It does not make me a predator. Or. <laughs> it seems like you're used to telling people that. I am. As you've had to point that out. But this is a good time for you because in New York City now, I don't think you can get. Bust it unless it's less than an ounce and a half. So right, and I yeah. do have less than an ounce and a half there on me. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Long biting. And to tell you the truth, that's just me conforming <laughs> to the laws of the land. Uh, although I was arrested, yeah, in uh, Florida, the, the, where you used to work, and yeah. uh, where I know you guys from, and uh, with less than a gram of weed, I had a prescription for in my pocket in uh, Vero Beach, and mm -hmm. they took my happy ass to jail. I've been partying in Florida for years. I didn't even know they had laws. <laughs> <laughs> it looked at me like everybody run amok down there. And I'll run amok with you. I'll run yeah. the fuck out of a muck with you. I'm a muck running motherfucker is yeah. what I am. And the cop got pissed. He goes, he goes, what'd you tell a doctor to get a prescription for marijuana? And I said, well, the doctor asked me if I had any symptoms that marijuana helped alleviate. And I said, I get bummed when I run out of weed. <laughs> Stamp. <laughs> Marijuana cures that. Yeah. Well, what's great in Florida, if you're busted there, just go to trial because they got to put 12 together and that's going to be one rowdy fucking crew. Right. Yeah. Every single time. I was actually, whenever I was, the only reason I was really pissed while I was going, if you go back and look at the mug shots, I looked like I was not in that great a mood. And uh, but uh, the, and the reason is I had a, show, a live show to do, and I was right. going to two different jails: city jail, county jail. And they were trying to process me because most of the guys there didn't want to arrest me for this little minuscule amount of pot. And uh, when I got finally got out of jail, there was a truckload of kids that had a big sign that said "Free Tater." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And I was two hours late to the show, and not one person left. They were. Uh, the, uh, my, my buddy, Steve Cook, my road manager who just passed, uh, was just on the, on the, on the microphone going, okay, he's in jail right now, <laughs> but there's a good chance <laughs> they're saying that within the hour he could be out and that's only an hour away, and, but not one person left. They all stayed and, uh, and, and forgave me. Well, I think unlike a lot of comedians, you make the whole thing look fun no matter what's happening. A lot of comedians stress with it, worry about it. It doesn't seem like you're one of those guys. Well, you know what? I, and, I, and I probably, and I, and I, I don't probably. And, uh, and the reason is, and because that, even that is so, it, just the thought of, of arresting someone with seven eighths of a gram of a harmless substance. And, and the man, literally, I was on my plane that you guys bought me. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm on the plane by myself. And, and these cops, these the cops, these pilots that, uh, that I fired for being dickheads, they called the police because you could follow the planes around on flight aware. If you want to, you can, any plane you want to, you can, you can do it. And, uh, and so they they called the police and said it's a drug plane and they have this big one eight hundred number, and they come down there and they go and I'm looking out of the window and it's like literally it's you know it's cops and dogs and guns and <laughs> flak jackets and all that stuff and and I'm like oh wow this is not going to go well probably and I got a show to do and and literally they told me what was going on I'm like oh no this isn't a drug plane at all here I, this is the weed I have right here less than a gram it turned out because they weighed it. And uh, <laughs> and they agreed. Mm -hmm. They agreed. They yeah. agreed that it was less than a gram. 
And uh, and they were gonna they're, they're you know they put the dogs on the plane. Of course, the dogs are barking because I smoke pot on the plane. But I, that's all <laughs> the weed I had. And uh, and they took me and put me away. And uh, that then that was a that, that was a life changing moment for me. And w- <laughs> actually, I didn't give a fuck because it sold records and <laughs> books yeah. and tickets and right. all the stuff that I need to sell. It well, helped. normally when you're like living like this, it's a guy who's you know writing rock and roll songs and he's 24 years old. But you've turned this into a lifetime deal for yourself. Although when I was 24, uh, I was I was easily this drunk. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, you know, yeah. I've, I've I've tried to do it during my career yeah. to be true to my nature, and I'm not selling it or or saying it's right. Yeah. But uh, in the evenings, I seem to get uh, you know fucked up and have a good time with my friends, listen to music, go right. to bars and shit, and that's just. You know, but whatever. see, the odd thing is, like, you get drunk every night, but you work nights, so uh, <laughs> makes it a little hairy. <laughs> I've had it go bad before. <laughs> I have. I did. I got banned from a club in uh, in uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, for ten years, and uh, the reason I got banned, and they loved me there. I was, I was, you know, I was a club comic forever, and uh, and. Uh, and most people, you know, most of the staffs, I'm always nice to the staff. I always party with them and, and get out of hand. And <clears throat> But it's, it's it's you you know the club, right, Vic? I, and, uh, I know the story. <laughs> oh, you know the story. All right. Well, right. well, Bill uh, Bill Foley, it's Sunday night, and Bill Foley is uh, the, the guitar player uh, uh, that Vic knows. And, and the guy, he, after the show's over, there's a, there's a lounge, and he's the guitar player that sits there and plays every cover and song. And he's and great. He's amazing. And yeah, so so, great. so they, 250 people leave the showroom, go across to the lounge. Sunday he, night. I've already been Sunday paid. for a decade, and he sings Bye Bye Miss American Pie, and any <laughs> Dylan song. Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And, I mean, you name them, he's singing. And it's, and it's how you close out the week. It's what everybody does. So, anyway. And oddly enough, uh, one time, just like the Edmund Fitzgerald, I left... Uh, fully loaded for Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, we should point out to the people at home the uh, the guy that's filling in the blanks here is is one of the funniest people in America, Vic Henley, sitting. Yeah, in the Victor. So seriously. Vic comes in and does my big gigs with me. We do Radio City. Uh, by the way, you want to do? Uh, I got this gig at, yeah. uh, with, uh, <laughs> that yeah. uh, we're selling tickets for. At uh, what is it? What Theater, are we, uh, Madison Square Garden in April. Wow, Madison yeah. Square Garden in April. We already did uh, Radio City yeah. together, so yeah. we're going to step down a notch and do uh, the uh, Madison Square Garden. Brian, I think it's so great that you got the other side of your memory here. That he, where where you get a blank spot, he's right there yeah, for you. Yeah, you know, and Victor's crazy. Uh, his memory is crazy good, and mine is crazy bad. Yeah. And uh, so it, it is great to have a, a one I, friend that has a great yeah. memory that can remind you of a couple of fucking things you said. Yeah, my, mine runs closer to yours. You know what I mean? Where right, you, I know you, got, you got some blank spots. Yeah, I know a couple of things right. happen here and there. I call them potholes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some of it was pot, and some of it's a little heavier. But um, still a hole. Yeah. It's, it's still yeah. a hole. It just doesn't make people laugh as much. They're just like, "Oh shit, that's sad." Right. It yeah. is right. <laughs> well, I will say this: you never will have to prove your bravery uh, ever again, because any man who uh, talks about going on stage doing acid, that's really the deep end. Oh, that was the, the other club I got kicked out of for <laughs> 10 years. Well, let me finish the one. I was yeah. at Columbus, Ohio. Bill Foley's playing and yeah. Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald and all this stuff. And this girl that's the girlfriend of the guy that's the assistant manager is just hitting on me blatantly, openly, just rubbing my leg when I dedicated this song to you and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, well, and she's feeding me purple shots, green <laughs> shots, blue shots. And it was back when I did multicolored shots and... And uh, so, and he's not there. The guy, her boyfriend's not yeah. there. So eventually, we're making out in the women's restroom, uh, and and he walks in because somebody said, "Hey, Ron's in there with your girlfriend making out in the bathroom." And I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying that's what happened that yeah. particular night. And they and and so many people noticed they had no choice but to uh, 
run me out of town for a few years. <laughs> yeah. and, and although people were sad about it, and and uh, I think some of those things could have been more or less career ending for you, though, right? Like they it, 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 they could have been, yeah, they could have been because it was all funny bone, and that was a lot right. of my work, and and uh, but the other one that I got kicked out of was the punchline, so they're totally disconnected, and I didn't give a fuck. You know? Right? They, had, <laughs> they got like three clubs. Yeah, I'm like I don't care. Funny bone had 21 clubs, which represented 42 <laughs> weeks of my year. Right. And uh, but let, you know they let it go and. But yeah, the uh, the other one was we were. It was a New Year's night, a long, long, long time ago, and uh, and there were three headliners from Texas that I knew in town yeah. doing the three clubs, right? And or the four clubs, and I was one of them. And I was doing this little, uh, great little theater in Buckhead in Atlanta, where I live now. But I, back then, I didn't. And and uh, we were all gonna eat acid. <laughs> and uh, we had a plan. It was Saturday night. We're all there. I had my acid, this acid that I'd gotten in uh, Alabama that somebody gave it to me. It was blotter acid. And I put it in my wallet. And I'm like, it was back at that time. I would like to go on stage and do acid, which is not <laughs> fucking very, a little unprofessional. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we, we have two shows. It's New Year's and on a Saturday night, it's a little 350 seat plays with a little wraparound balcony perfect place to do stand-up and my opening my, my middle act uh, plays a didgeridoo <laughs> which is the single most annoying thing in the history of any kind of noise is a didgeridoo and and uh, they they're invented in the australian out outback to transfer sound through buildings and stuff and it's just crazy and uh, so I get off the first show, and I'm like, oh, great. My friends, they're all getting their ass from somebody else. And I'm like, oh, I got blotter ass from Alabama. You know, how good that could that be? You know, that's probably, I got the worst acid ever <laughs> in my pocket. I didn't, and, uh, and it turns out, so I go ahead and eat both hits, and I have a show to do in an hour. And and uh turns out this acid probably wasn't made in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, it was probably made in a laboratory in California. Right. Somebody mailed it to Alabama. And uh, cause like 30 minutes later, I'm laid out on my back going, that was a, that's horrible, Ron. You're, you're useless, dude. You're fucking useless. And, yeah. uh, and I turn the lights out. I'm in my green room and, and I know they're looking for me because people come in there and look and they'll open the door and, but because uh, I'm laying in the dark, nobody really, they think I'm gone, right? And I'm, <laughs> I'm not gone. I'm going. <laughs> and, um, so uh, then I, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, God, Ron, why do you do this? Why can't you just do drugs like a regular person <laughs> in, you know, controlled environments that make some kind of sense? And, and uh, uh, so anyway, now I hear the didgeridoo, right? <laughs> Which penetrates any kind of concrete. <laughs> I'm like, oh, and I know he closes with the didgeridoo bit. <laughs> so I'm like, now it's time for me to go perform. And, and uh, so now they, they look in the room. Now they're panicking and they turn the lights on. They see me laying on the floor and they're like, what's wrong? Are you okay, Ron? I'm like, I'm not feeling great. I'm, I'm not feeling good. And, but uh, but they're like, you got to do a show. It's happening right now. So it's show business. And I've never not done a show, even when I probably should have not done a show. And <laughs> so they're shoving me out there. And uh, I'm like, just stick to your act. Just stick to your act. And, and it's, a, it's really a, it, it's a, it's, it's a room that has a high stage. It's built like a, like a little theater, a little vaudeville theater. So you're not down in the room like Go Bananas or whatever in <laughs> Cincy. And so you're back up away from them. So, and I'm just killing i mean i'm just murdering i'm like this is great i can see the rhythm of the material in my eyes and i was playing off it yeah. i was killing this room and i was like just stick with your material ron if you think of something funny just don't say it <laughs> just move on <laughs> And so I'm just, I'm sweating and I'm really fucked up, but they're not really looking at that. They're just laughing and having fun. And, and I'm drinking a beer back then. I smoke cigarettes and drink beer on stage. And, and, uh, and the fact that I'm doing so well, the staff started watching. So, you know, you're having a good set if the staff stops doing everything and starts watching the show. And so just because I ran out of beer, I didn't ask for another beer, but they just noticed it and they brought me another beer and set it up. They just wanted me to keep going. And, you know, and, uh, for some reason, I said, uh, 
Oh, look, they uh, I make you laugh. They bring me a beer. Later, if they uh, if I get you to jump through a hoop, uh, they're going to give me a little more acid than some blow. <laughs> Which sounded <laughs> hilarious to me. I'm like, Bob, yeah. you probably should have warned them before this little bit of comedy comes out because give them time to tape their ribs and get ready for all the guffaws that yeah. are coming up right now. Well, it turns out there were no guffaws. At all, no. There was a big sound. You heard somebody drop a tray of glasses right. in the back, and and I'm like, uh oh. Now they're looking at me. Now they're going, oh, his eyes are pinned. This guy's so fucked up. What is wrong with this? This is, and, and I got 20 minutes to go. For the last 20 minutes of the show, I look like Gene Wilder and Young Frankenstein after the whole thing had gone to shit. And I'm just trying to put out some lights and shit, and stomp out a fire. Oh, and... that's, that's when you realize like you're in Buckhead, where some Jokes are going to go over, but the acid and blow suddenly like, oh, oh no, acid you're... and blow would be great. In Buckhead. Yeah. This is South. This is downtown. Oh, and this downtown. place called the Atlanta underground. It's not yeah. there anymore. The whole thing's not there anymore, but that's where you lost them yeah. completely. Like, yeah, we I like, lost them completely. We're not, you're not one of us yeah. anymore. No, no, you're, you're your a... own entity yeah. and, and, uh, and you should go back to your scripted material, <laughs> <laughs> but it was too late. I tried yeah. that. I said, Oh, I'll just go back to my scripted material. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, not really so much. And so, and we don't have a Sunday show, so I got to get paid. Mm -hmm. So I got to, I'm like, oh, okay, Joy, that, that's not great. I really wish I didn't have to go talk to the manager of the club right now, this second, and, but whatever. And uh, I get up there, and, and this is a partying club. This is, I used to buy dope from this fucking club, and now they're acting like I'm out of fucking hand. And, and uh, the guy, the, the manager, who you know, Victor, and uh, he goes, uh, you a little fucked up on stage tonight, Ron? I said, I'll, I'll take a check. <laughs> <laughs> no. So literally 10 years go by that they will not book me back in Atlanta and uh, until Foxworthy, we start blue collar. And I'm like, man, Jeff, I know you've done a lot for me, buddy, but I would love to come back here and do shows, but they won't let me back in that club. But he goes, well, how long has it been? 10 years. What'd you do? I asked him, okay. <laughs> <all right." laughs> so he calls him and goes, yeah. hey, come on, man. It's Ron. Come on. You, you know, he said he was sorry and it's been 10 years and. You know, let him back in. Come on. He loves Atlanta. And, uh, that, that's so one of the things that success helps, though, right? Go back and fix some of those places yeah. in the past. You're right. That's yeah. The, yeah, blue collar was going on. <laughs> they, I think they saw the potential and yeah. uh, ticket sales and all and whatnot. So. Well, we were, we were talking about when you're headlining, you know, the Funny Bones at the time and the Punchline Clubs. This is about as big as you can hope to get in comedy. Now, like, occasionally something else flares up where someone puts you in a movie yeah. and suddenly catches. But the the level to be able to go out and headline that is where all the best people go. And then there's a yeah. bit of luck that, you know, some guys catch. But there's great people at that level. Yeah, you know? that, that was... Uh... That was what my dream was, you yeah. know, to be, to, you know, when I was started doing an open mic, I mean, I, I really wasn't even thinking about doing this professionally ever. I thought, mm -hmm. well, I, it's, you know, it's fun to do and I seem to be pretty good at it. And, and, uh, the bigger it got, I never saw it happening. I really never saw me going to be a big comic. I really didn't, even though I watched it happen to Jeff, uh, Jeff blew up. He was standing right next to me and I never saw it happen for me. No, of course. And, Cause it's uh, like, if, if your buddy just hit the lottery, you're like, Oh, maybe I'll hit the lottery. Right. Too. Exactly. You know right, what I mean? Yeah, right. So I would look at guys like rich Jenny, who was so good. And, oh, yeah. I mean, just one of the greatest comics ever. And he never could turn the corner, you know, into that. Right. So I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be a guy that doesn't ever turn the corner. And, uh, but I loved it where I was. I made as much money as my idiot friends did in, in comedy clubs and I wasn't playing my, paying my taxes. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that makes it seem yeah. like you're making even a little more money yeah. than you are. You got a little disposable income. If you <laughs> quit tossing a little chunk to uncle Sam. And, uh, it's very true that a lot of road comedians think, and you hey, got to remember this yeah. spans 29 years. <laughs> yeah. So th this is a long, this is my whole life. Right. I started at 29, and I'm and I and I've been doing it for 29 years, and wow. uh, so it, it was a big mishmash of me having no idea how to make this happen, or even think it could happen. Or, but I considered myself very, very successful yeah. as a as a club act that could go in and make. I, I mean, like at my 
peak, I think I made like $1,600 a week and, and air in the shittiest room in a fucked up apartment. You know, that's was right. my gig. And, and that was fine with me. You know, I, I thought I was lucky to be doing it. Hell, and, and, you're working with a couple other guys are going, how do I get there every week? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Every week. They're like, if I only had his money, <laughs> yeah. if I, always, that was the big joke. Yeah. Was, uh, the opening act going, uh, we're going to go to the mall and watch the headliner spend money. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. But, uh, but yeah, but it was, uh, that, that and I really never saw it happen. And even after blue collar came out, because it kind of went straight to DVD mm -hmm. and, and I knew that was huge, but that was all Jeff, you know, I was just riding the fucking tails of it. And, and, uh, I, I never took credit for any of that. You know, I always gave credit to Jeff where it belonged and, and I, I really didn't think it would, it would ever happen. And then, uh, and then one day they put it out on DVD and it sold like hotcakes. And so literally the biggest selling comedy album of all time is blue collar one. And, uh, so over 4 million copies and, and, uh, blue collar two was right behind it at number two. And, uh, and, but I didn't really consider it as mine. You know, right. I, I didn't, I, I, I wouldn't even count that as albums I've sold until recently when somebody says, well, no, you were part of that band. Think of it that yeah. way. You were, one of the guys in the band and yeah. they sold all those records. You get to say that, you know, you get to say you sold that those records also. And, uh, but that should have been the thing that happened. That was like the freak thing. And then you catch your own personal wave and we're able to handle it. I mean, for me with you, it's, it's one thing. Okay. People are noticing you, you get out there, but then you get to play these big theaters and it's a really different animal than playing clubs you know well i you know i the, the thing is i was so well trained at it because i opened for jeff before blue collar right so i was doing big rooms anyway and i was doing short sets i was doing 20 minute sets and that's not easy either i, I can't even imagine how to do it today but, but you got to take a dead huge crowd and right. lift them up you know Vic, i'm lucky enough to have Vic do some for me he does radio city with me and then uh and then we're doing what Carnegie Hall or what is it? Uh, the theater, Madison, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> right, right. And, there uh, it is, ladies and gentlemen, Vic Henley. The memory. <laughs> right, thank you, Victor. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Most, of, but the thing is now, Vic, a lot of us in the room could have came up with that one. <laughs> we're right. starting to know it for sure. I can, I can tell yeah. you, the, the girl he fucked in the bathroom in Columbus, Ohio, oh, God. Kimberly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving the last name. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not Yet. either. Yeah. Because I didn't remember Kimberly. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these, he's just going to have to take your word for it. Well, you know, yeah. He trusts me. Yeah. <laughs> There's a thing, though, with you, Ron, and I think, uh, I, I think it's that Texas thing that a lot of great comedians that have come out of Texas have that almost don't give a fuck thing that makes people feel safer with them. You know what I mean? Like when you walk out on the stage and it reminded me of like when Hicks would come out or Kinnison would come out, there was a different type of confidence in the big rooms. Well, that's, you know, that's probably something I learned from Hicks and Kinnison yeah. was that you need to go out there and be true to your nature and that's enough. Yeah. You know, and if you're not true to your nature, you'll never do a thing, you know, because audiences just pick up on it. You have to be who you are. And there, there were definitely people back in the day saying, no, you should be more like Jeff and Bill and Dan. You should right. be corporate friendly. You're passing up all this money. And uh, you should do this this way. And I'm like, that's not who I am. Was it even a choice? Do you think no. you could have figured it out? No, I, I had to. I had to. Because, you know, because I was working in, in nightclubs. Yeah. So I was every night I performed for, you know, 300, if it was 300 people, it was 300 people, but they were drinking and smoking and partying just like me. I'm like, well, I think there's a pretty good sized group of people out there that don't mind having a couple of cocktails and smoking some weed. And yeah. like, Why don't I just be myself? And, and that's what was uh, so beautiful about Foxworthy is he was himself too, you know? Yeah. And uh, that was so beautiful. What was so beautiful about uh, uh, Kennison and, and Pryor and Cosby and, and all those guys that had nothing else in common except they did comedy and they were true to their nature. And, uh, but if, if, if you can't get a hold of that, if you see somebody else's nature that makes a lot of money and you go, I'm going to be more like that guy because he makes, that's the death move. I, right. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I've seen people go to try, I'm going to try to be more marketable. And did I lose a lot of money? Yes. 
uh, from corporate gigs and corporate sponsors. But do I have to wake up in the morning and worry about what Prilosec has to say about what I think? No, I do not. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a freedom. That's it is a freedom. freedom. Yeah. It is a freedom. And I kind of think that that's Texas. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people make the mistake of thinking Texas is part of the South, but it's almost the difference between like Nashville country music and Austin country music. It's a different animal. It know? is a little bit different animal. Yeah. yeah. I kind of feel like Americans look at Texas like the rest of the world looks at america you know what i mean like we see an extreme and we try to guess oh so that's what they're like you know right. but there's so many extremes that come out of texas you know yeah there, you know there's been some uh some great uh great storytellers come out of texas yeah. and uh in oklahoma also they, they, the people they don't get as much recognition but uh, right but some of the really just fantastic storytellers came out of there too writers and, uh, Will and Rogers yeah and and uh, but uh, Steve Martin's from Austin or from uh, Waco, Texas, right? And Kittison and Hicks both started stand up in uh, in Houston at the comedy workshop. And uh, <clears throat> and I don't know, I, I really to this day can't explain my popularity, <laughs> yeah. I just can't explain yeah. it. I don't know, I really don't understand what it is that people are so uh, connected, feels connected to. And I do think, well, you said that. You're that you know you're true to your nature, which is much harder. You think it would be the easiest right. thing in the world to connect with, but there's something about a guy when you start stand up, you're almost as far away from yourself as you could be. So I had toned work. titties the first two years. <laughs> all right, well, that that can't be right, can it? I mean, yeah, of just. But I did. I, you yeah. know, that's true. I mean, yeah. it's so far removed. You know, there's no. I mean, they, they do have some comedy classes, which, you know, that yeah. people can take, I guess. But I don't think you can learn timing from that and and uh, or pace or rhythm or, you know, I don't know what you can learn from it. I mean, but there are certainly things that you have to learn that, right. that somebody could teach you. And and uh, but you really have no idea. You know, you're literally I'm trying to get on the next open mic night and they just said, no, I have right. to wait a week because I ate it last week. And I'm like, OK. All right. Well, great. So I'm still in the whole thing, though, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So I, you know, you have no idea until it, and the whole thing just has to transpire in front of you, and you have to let it happen, and you have to also be, you know, committed. I've done eleven thousand live shows. Mm. Wow. That's a lot. Eleven thousand live shows. Yeah. And it's and you're still kind of learning in in a lot of ways. You're still picking up on things. I still want that. to be better. Yeah. I still want to be a better comedian. You know, it's been a. Uh, I think an incredibly rough year for comedy because we lost some really great people right. this year. Uh, you know, Tim Wilson, David Brenner. Can I do uh, a Tim Wh Wilson song for you? Yeah, this is my ahead, favorite. Please. This is a 50 second song Tim Wilson wrote. Uh, and it's a perfect song. It, it goes from a, a, a perfectly good day to the worst disaster you can ever imagine to salvation and possibly a bright future in 50 seconds. He was paddling to San Diego when a wave took him out to sea and he washed up on the shore of Waikiki. He's the only illegal Mexican in Honolulu. <laughs> He's been here 20 minutes, found him a roofing job to do. <laughs> he don't know if they're going to make him go or if they're going to let him stay. But it's looking pretty good because they're already calling him Don Ho Zay. <laughs> That's great. Tim Wilson. Great. Tim Wilson. One of the real greats. And it's just amazing. It just felt like there was one loss after another this year of really, really great people. Yeah, Williams. And uh, I don't know if you know my Robin Williams story. Not a lot of people do, but. Tell I had a brief bout with sobriety a few years ago that I, <laughs> that I was able to overcome with help from my friends. And Victor, you helped me get through that, didn't you? And, and uh, this bout with sobriety started at a rehab in, uh, in uh, Malibu. And uh, I wasn't particularly good at it. You know, I was two weeks into it. You know, I was pretty, I was, I was not doing well. 
So they said, well, hey, you're having this, we're doing a special thing, Ron, for you, and uh, you're going to go have a lunch with a secret lunch. And, and I'm like, okay, and I'm in a car by myself. They take me to the Bel Air Hotel, Robin Williams, Bobcat Goldthwait. Wow. So. Yeah. And those guys sat down and talked to you. Had you known them before then? No. I knew Bob. Yeah, yeah. Bobcat, but not Robin. And, and we didn't spend one second talking about the amazingly boring story of sobriety. We talked about jokes and comedy and stand up, and he helped me write a, a work on a bit that I was working on. We sat there and laughed for two hours, you know. And you had never met him before. Never that. met him. Never saw him again. So that's the kind of amazing guy that would be there for another person. Bobcat, uh, to me, is one of the great artists in yeah. this country. A great director. But what do you say that you know your life got to that point that here these two men would show up to be there for you right well you know it uh it showed me how much heart that they, and he, you know and robin the two hours that i knew him was on the whole two hours i mean he was robin williams in character which is all he really was comfortable doing you know so n nobody really knew what was going on behind that and i didn't even wonder or care you know i just thought it was amazing you know that this guy would come out no he, he didn't know me at all but he would come out and try to help me through this little tiny struggle that i was having and then he took his own life you know and uh it was tough yeah. tougher than it should have been probably for me yeah just because he was so kind for no reason at all but that of course says about his humanity but also about where your career that these guys uh, to me, two of the really great artists of all time, I look over and say, one of our guys is in trouble. You know, he's not feeling something. Let's just hang out with him today. Yeah. That's a long way to take your career, my yeah. friend. Yeah, sorry. I had no, you don't have to <laughs> sorry. be sorry for that. Uh, let, let me tell you, it's, uh, I, I didn't know the story, but uh, I do know Bobcat, and I know, you know, uh, that Robin was always looking out for people right and, and they were they'd been friends forever and they yeah. were best friends and, and bobcat had been sober sober for like 25 years yeah and i know that sobriety didn't work out for robin or or me either yeah. one but uh <laughs> so uh and, and that doesn't make the story any less special to me you know? yeah and it's also a story i never ever told until he died mm. and then I, and when he died i thought well i should tell that story you know i should tell that story of his compassion you know, for a fellow comic that was struggling well, with his fucking demons. Yeah. It's not easy, man. It's not easy. And it's also, uh, you know, I think the demon thing is what sometimes connects funny people to other funny people, you know? Yeah, none of us are that uh, normal. That's yeah. That's for sure. You know, it's a nest of uh, yeah. odd characters. Yeah. And I'm proud to be one of them. It is. You know, it but, is a source of pride. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, from your story, the thing that I love about it is my, also that, that you were accepted by them. You know, that's amazing to me as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the thing about losing Robin was that set me sideways because obviously we grew up with his kind of comedy, meaning he exploded. And it almost felt like you could lose anyone at any time after that you know for a short time after that right. to somebody who thought okay he's he's achieved everything that i'd fantasized about you know and maybe that's not enough you know that's the hard part of that story right <clears throat> well if you want to see me fall completely apart uh, <laughs> yeah. uh my best friend uh and my road manager uh a f best friend of 51 years past three weeks ago and uh but while he was going through the struggles of cancer robin took his life and so steve was like god i'm fighting with all my heart yeah and this guy seems to have everything and uh decides to take his life and that's depression you know it's yeah. an evil evil thing we just don't know dude we yeah. don't know what anybody else is dealing with All right you know you know and in in so many ways for me that's what makes humor 
and music. And it's all born all, from tragedy, my friend. Yeah, so it's all there. Write your joke. Here yeah. it is. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot to be said about going up on stage and being funny and even coming to a show and laughing is almost a giant fuck you to mortality. You know what I mean? It's our way of saying, we yeah, know right. this is finite. All right. So let's have fun before the shithouse right. burns down. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we we're talking about, like you said, with music, the fact that you're not even the most talented person in your family, I think to right. me is I'm not a, either. an amazing thing. Um, Ron's wife has got one of the great singing voices that I think I've ever heard. Uh, what What is that like for you to be, you know, to get lucky enough to... Have this in your life. Yeah, right, Margo. Uh, yeah. yeah, but if you know, Margo Ray is my wife. Margo and, Ray is uh, easily one of the best uh, yeah. singers that ever lived. And, uh, you know, and we had, uh, you know, we had cancel, cancer battles with her also. Yeah. And, uh, but she luckily, it, thinks, it looks like we beat that. And uh, she's, even though they were, uh, you know, the summer before last, they were, you know, shoving everything they could shove at her to keep it uh, going. And uh, so uh, they aimed everything away from her vocal cords, you know, and uh, she came through with her vocal cords completely intact and, but not her stamina. And uh, so now all that's back and uh, it's the best live show. I watched her. One of my good friends is sings, sings, uh, uh, lead for a little uh, band called ACDC and uh, <laughs> Brian Johnson and I watched her make him cry uh, in his living room singing the nearness of you acapella big old yeah. fat big ass rock star motherfucker <laughs> really yeah. listen to Margo sing if you're yeah. that tough and the big old tear rolling down his cheek and uh so it's amazing, you know, I get to, uh, I, I get to, that's my favorite thing to do. You know, the, you know, the, I've had a really long year of loss and, you know, the, it's great to have the one thing that brings you true joy, mm -hmm. no matter what's going on, you know, uh, true joy. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be married to that person so she can sing me out of it. Whatever. Yeah. I'm the funk. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And also, here's the coolest thing ever. We were just clapping and laughing. She wrote a holiday song called This Holiday Night, and it debuted this uh, this week uh, at number 13 on the national charts. Now, this is the only people in front of her are, at this point, are Buble with four songs, Kelly Clarkson with two songs, and then, like, Siberian Transcendental <laughs> Toothache or whatever that band is, and... Uh, so, uh, so that and that's the highest debut we've had with it. It's the only re original song in the top hundred, and she wrote it. it's a little simple little waltz called this holiday night. And a big celebration for us. Yeah, that's just uh, that's just amazing. You know, that's just amazing. Yeah, I get to call my friends and ask them how amazing it is. Okay, all right, here's the deal. We own this little record company called Organica. We have an amazing one artist. <laughs> and uh, we've we've released seven songs and charted all seven of them in the top 40 and all the way up to, we had Holiday Night to number four one year. And uh, and so this year, uh, the uh, the devil picked it up. I'm not even going to say the name because it'll just <laughs> queer the whole deal. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, we, we've never de debuted higher than 35 and we debuted at 13. And so, yeah, that's great. We, we've been screaming. That's fantastic, dude. And particularly coming after a tough year, yeah. you know? Yeah. Big success. Big, yeah. uh, big thrill. Do you, uh, I mean, to be involved like with Christmas stuff, are you a spiritual guy or is something you don't think about much? Yeah, I probably think about it more now right. than ever, you know. But uh, my uncle is this guy named Dr. Charles Pollard, and he used to be the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He has three doctorates, uh, theology, psychology, and philosophy, and uh, interesting guy to talk to. And uh, and uh, some people say we're kind of like uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, <laughs> Swagger, you know, and uh, – and uh but a little bit yeah and uh because he actually is my cousin he's yeah. just he's the same age as my dad so i've always called him my uncle and uh 
and I kind of agree with him. You know, he's studied all this stuff and all these years, and and uh, and he's a great guy, very funny. And I learned how to do stand up watching him preach. You know, for sure. Yeah. And uh, but he said uh, we were talking about it because of somebody else has died, and uh, and uh, I asked him. I said, "What do you what do you what do you believe?" You know, and uh, after all these years, and he goes, "I believe that when we die, we're going to be surprised." we have no idea and nobody has any idea that it's just going to be surprised that when it happens, you're going to go, I had no idea. Yeah, that, that got that me. Really strange, <laughs> right? That that happened. So, I mean, and spiritually that's where I'm at. I mean, yeah. I know for a fact there's life after death because I worked in a haunted house <laughs> and I swear to God. That's the funniest shit. That these spooks were real. <laughs> well, you said watching him brought you stand up, and and that was also I'll go back to Kinnison came from that type of thing. And Chris so Rock also Hicks was uh, around that, right? But but that, Rock's father, what did Rock's father, his uncle, well, one was a preacher. Well, right? Rock, almost all of his stand up to me is. Preacher. cadence yeah it's just the cadence of a preacher right and but, mine too i mean yeah. all my relatives could hear my uncle's cadence yeah which makes you sometimes think that maybe it's that connection of right? human beings being together and whatever that rhythm is the same as the gospel music where people you're like well i don't know about the lyrics but this music makes me feel connected to other people yeah maybe that's know? what it is yeah maybe that's what it is and i think sometimes that when art is done well it's connecting us to our higher angels even if it's just for that moment Ron. you know when you're together with that audience somebody isn't thinking about cancer at the time or right. they're not thinking about money problems for sure. they're for sure. out and we're all together Laughing and having a good time. Yeah, I, yeah, I do understand the healing power of laughter. I certainly do, and and uh, I've seen it uh, transform people for even if it's just for a short period of time. And I have people tell me all the time about stories that they were trying to go through these horrible, horrible struggles in life, and that I they could plug in one of my records and yeah, and laugh through part of it, and that was very cool. You know, that's so always a story I love. Well, here's what I think helps. Because in your stories, you're always in worse shape than most people listening. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, there is, and then, and a lot of this, you know, a lot of your big trouble wasn't even all that long ago. You know what I mean? Like, like I said, but you caught that wave, but before that, you've been pretty honest about, you know, drowning. Well, a it's hard bit. to uh, it's hard to catch me doing anything because I talk about it on stage right after it happens. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. We heard he smokes pot. Oh, right. did you really? Oh, how'd you dig that piece of little trivia? Up? Right. Yeah, 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 he's, and yeah. that is also, by the way, to me, a Texas thing. There is uh, was a big movie star who said to Kennison, and I don't want to say who he, who he is, but he was in all the Rocky movies. And he goes, <laughs> and he said, Sam, we all do coke. You're the only one talking about it. You know what I mean? Right. Because he, Sam started being followed when he was getting. But right. there's something about you guys that you just don't want to hide. You know, no, you yeah. don't want to hide it. So, have you ever heard my Kinnison story? Yeah, I, mean, I, I love to hear it. Yeah, dude, it's a. Uh, I'm. Uh, I've been doing stand up for a couple of years, and uh, Kinnison is the big deal. And I'm. I'm a huge fan, and and uh, he's he, he's canceled a date at the Dallas County Convention Theater. He's coming back to do a remake date, and LeBeau is in rehab. So there's a lot of <laughs> rehab in these sort of stories, yeah. and. Uh, and uh, Lebov, if you don't know Carl Lebov, is an amazingly One wonderful comedian, and uh, and so they called the Improv that day, the day where they're coming in, because I think it dawned on them they didn't have an opening act. And they're like, "Hey, do you got anybody around there that can do this?" And they're like, "Hey, this kid's doing pretty good." And and uh, and so they called and go, "You want to open for Kennison tonight?" So I didn't have a lot of time to freak out about it, you know. I was just, I'm like, "Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah," <laughs> but I and I had never, I'd only done comedy clubs, so this is two thousand people at the Dallas County Convention Theater. And and uh, we get there, and, and Sam's not there. Nobody's there. And, and the back of the house at a comedy show is pretty dull because nobody's there. You know, there's no, but there is no band. There's no support. There's no nothing. My wife was there. My my now brother-in-law, Alec Ramundo, was there. And uh, so, and, and, uh, and Sam's brother, Bill, who was his manager, 
And he goes, we don't know where he is, Ron. We don't know where he is, <laughs> but we got to start the show. <laughs> and uh, I only got like 15 minutes, and that's all they want me to do, right? And he's like, he goes, listen, Ron, a lot of times uh, Sam's opening act is like a sacrificial lamb uh, <laughs> because they just want to hear Sam s- s- scream and go nuts. And, and, uh, and so if it doesn't go well or if it goes horrible or whatever, it doesn't matter at all just do your time and and we get it 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 happens to carl as good as he is and i'm like okay and i i go out there and and i killed that was the best set i'd ever had i was like i was doing it really slow i'm like that was great right this is not what they were saying would happen at all i'm doing well and i'm looking over him and it was kind of like the the buddy holly story when they're playing the new york club and he's killing they didn't think he was gonna kill and he's looking over great go go so uh so he's going stretch because sam still wasn't there and, and uh but i run out you know i run out I've, i've turned my 15 into 20 and i am <laughs> out of material and i'm like get out of yeah! <laughs> biggest noise i've ever heard ever and so i walk off and and uh sam's still uh still not there and uh we have a little uh dressing room has a six pack of beer and uh cheese tray or whatever and and uh they turn the lights on and they're like, I don't guess he's coming. And and then all of a sudden he shows up. There's like 15 people, big limos pull up, the big party shows up all powered. And, and, uh, so he's got these 2000 people. Now they're sitting back down and, uh, and, uh, he sends his, uh, bodyguard to get me out of my room and bring him back. He's got a little dressing suite and room in the back. He's got lobsters and stuff and, <laughs> and a bunch of people up there eating them. And then they take me back to Kennison's little room back there and he's back there with the girl that has obviously sold some pussy <laughs> in her day, and obviously, and uh, and he's banging a vial of uh, coke, a big vial of coke. There's something stuck in it, and he's banging it on the counter trying to get it out. And he, I walk in the room, and Kennison looks at me, and he goes, "Heard you killed him, cowboy." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, uh, Sam, it's a great crowd. Uh, you're gonna have fun with these guys." And uh, of course, I didn't know what to say, so that's what I said. And he goes. I bought a cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So, so we, I do a little bump, and then he does this gigantic bump and fakes a heart attack, <laughs> and nobody buys it but me. <laughs> because they're all part of his camp, right? right? They've yeah. seen him do this act before, yeah. and I'm like. The greatest comedian that I've ever had is dying. I just did God. I'm ready to stick my fucking mouth on his mouth and suck breath back into him. And uh, and he goes, I'm just fucking with you. And he hops up. And he goes, i show you how to do this. And goes out there and just absolutely murders. And well, they're, the people that own the Funny Bone and the people that own the Punchline and and another chain, they were in the crowd and they saw that set. And they they're like, Ron, we'd like to go to dinner and talk about the future of your comedy career. That's on one shoulder. The other shoulder is Sam going, hey, we're going to go to some titty bars, do some blow. And I'm like, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow if that's uh So there's my Sam yeah, business story. That's fantastic. Uh, before we go, let's take the the mic over to Vic Kenley here. And I was just going to ask you, uh, Vic, how, how long do you guys go back? I, sh- what- I showed up about a week after that. Yeah, right. Or something close, because one of the first things he told me is, well, they the the club in Arlington. There's a funny moment. There was one in Dallas, one in Arlington, one in Fort Worth, and they had a condo. And he was about to quit his job because the Bone people told him they're going to give him a lot of gigs. And uh, he was always bopping by the club. He was just because he, he was he's he traveling salesman, so he, he wasn't locked down in a cubicle somewhere. He was a window salesman. And he was going around Dallas, calling on these contractors, trying to get them to sell the windows and doors. And so the club picks me up, takes me to the condo, and leaves me. He goes by the club like 10 minutes later, and he goes, who's working here this week? And there's like, well, there's a musical duo, Malone and New Cheese were headlining, and this dude from Alabama named Vic Henley's Midland, and he's at the condo now. We just took him over there. And he's like, well, I hope you took him and got him some goddamn groceries or something. Did you get him lunch or anything? You took the poor fucker over there and just left him by himself? And they're like, well, he didn't say anything. And he's like, fuck. So I'm sitting in this three-bedroom condo in Arlington, Texas, in an apartment complex. The phone rings. It's this jackass calling me. And I pick up the phone. He's like, hey, uh, my name's Ron White. I'm a comedian. I can't believe these some bitches didn't get you any lunch or anything. I'm coming over there and do you like pot? <laughs> yeah. 
I'm like, I love pot. He goes, okay, I've got some pot. I'm going to be a comedian. <laughs> and he comes and picks me up, and Bobby Valentine was manager of the Texas Rangers at the time, and he had a sports bar nearby. God, your memory's so good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we went, he took me, he said, we'll go over here to Bobby Valentine. If he would have gone, who's the baseball team in Arlington? I'd have gone, Kansas City Royals. <laughs> <laughs> But Bob, so he had a sports bar there, and he goes, we'll go over here by Valentine's, we'll have some beers. He goes, all I'm doing the rest of the afternoon is just riding around telling my customers that I'm going to be a comedian. He just keeps <laughs> telling me. If he said it once, he said it 20 times the rest of the afternoon. And uh, Gerald Kubach and Mitch Kutash, who ran the Funny Bone Chain, they had seen him, and they're like, we got 20 clubs. If we give them to you two times a year, that's 40 weeks worth of work. And I'm like, I'm already doing this. It's real. <laughs> yeah, it's real. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so I met him right, that's how we met, somewhere around. So 29 years ago, me 29 too. Years. Yeah, right, yeah, right, 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 right. And where are you guys playing the next time you're in New York? The next time we're in New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My Madison, dick. Madison Square Garden. The theater. Yeah. The theater. Yeah. Yeah. The theater. <laughs> Ron White, you're a good man, my hey, friend. Thanks very much. Thank uh, you so much. Ron yeah, White, thank everybody. you very much for listening. Thank you.